Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're delighted to spend some time talking with you about tax reform and how it impacts uh, the real estate and construction industry and so many of our clients in that field. So to get us started, uh, first I'm going to let Mark Cooter, who is our firm's national leader of real estate and construction industry group, talk to you a little bit about this and what he, his thoughts are on tax reform. Mark? Welcome, everyone. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Mark Cooter. I'm the national leader for Cherry Beckert for our real estate and construction group. Uh, our primary focuses are uh, in the areas of clients that who own and develop commercial, multifamily, and hospitality real estate, as well as the construction industry, and it's one of the primary specializations within the firm. Um, we have a broad topic, as, uh, as Sarah mentioned. We're going to discuss the 2018 Tax Act and implications on specifically on real estate and construction. We've got a very diverse audience, as well as it's a large topic in a short window to discuss. So we're going to try to hit on all the, the points that we can. We certainly encourage you, if you're a Cherry Becker client, to reach out to your tax professional contact. Uh, to get further information as well as feel free to uh, reach out to any of the presenters on this presentation uh, for further information and we'll be happy to, to guide you uh, toward a uh, resolution of your question. Some of the implications that you'll be hearing about uh, today to, to focus on will be, uh, number one, write off of your capital investment. How quickly can you write off uh, investment in a real estate project and what changes have occurred there? how you may be capitalizing a project and the impact and limitations that may be involved as far as debt versus equity uh, and impact from the new legislation, the effective tax rate that you may be paying on one of your projects, both with the lower rates as well as some special deductions that are allowed under the new bill, and of course, choice of entity considerations with the lower rates both on the corporate side and the individual side. Uh, you should consider the choice of entity to ensure that you have the proper entity uh, selection. Our goals for today are identify tax saving opportunities in the new legislation, uh, identify deduction limitations and tax return, reporting complexities in the new law, and help you begin to plan for 2018. Our agenda is uh, we're going to go over some cost recovery and depreciation, accounting methods, federal credits, energy credits, cost segregation, business entity analysis, as well as the credits and accounting methods. Ron Wainwright will be discussing one through items one through seven. Sarah McGregor will be discussing items eight through ten, which involve some of the newer and more complex areas of this legislation, which are the special pass-through deduction, the 20% special pass-through deduction that's allowed new limitations on interest expense and excess business losses and other partnership provisions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron and we'll begin our presentation. Thank you, Mark. And let me also welcome you and thank you for spending your time this afternoon with us. Um, we do have a lot to cover and I'll try and get through those seven items as efficiently but most importantly effectively as possible. So starting with the cost recovery items, what we saw in the Tax Cut Jobs Act, which is significant when we think about our real estate construction practice and clients, is obviously the increase from the current 50%, but it is 40 in 18, uh, to 168K or the bonus depreciation rules up to 100%. Um, so the most significant part is that it eliminated the requirement underneath the old bonus depreciation rules for the original use or new piece of the property. So now we're dealing with new and used with respect to kind of the first time in the hands of taxpayers. That is significant, obviously, as we look forward in time in regards to the acquisition of real property as well as personal property uh, effective September 28th. 2017. So this is one of the few provisions, if not the only provision, in the Tax Cut Jobs Act uh, that was retroactive. Unfortunately, there is a sunset provision, so uh, it extends and, and modifies our availability of that first year 100% expense for qualified property 
through 2026. And then as you see in the right-hand side of the slide, very similar to what was happening underneath old law of 168K is there's a phase down uh, approach. So a uh, significant opportunity, and as I'll talk later in our presentation, uh, very impactful when we think about cost segregation and reclassifying assets lower than the, the 39 and, and 27 and a half year. Uh, other cost recovery implications, uh, specifically in the like-kind exchange or 1031 area, now there is a limit in regards to the non-recognition of that gain. It's only attributable to real property. Um, that is obviously held primarily for sale. So we've lost the, the personal property ability to obviously uh, not create a gain, carry over basis. So that's very important and it applies to exchanges after 1231 of 2017. Um, so there is an exception. Uh, we'll be more than happy to talk to you about that more specifically in regards to uh, exchanges that were in progress at the end of 2017. Um, second item when you think about cost recovery in the real property concept is it eliminated the separate definition of qualified leasehold property and, and qualified restaurant property uh, and qualified retail improvement uh, property. Um, so for those, we've got a 15-year recovery period for that QIP as we formally called it. Uh, I would point out that between the House and the Senate bill and ultimately came out of conference is the 39-year recovery period was retained uh, along with the 27 and a half year recovery period period retained uh, obviously 39 uh, for non-residential real property and 27 and a half for residential real property. So a number of changes when we think about uh, you know, cost recovery. And last but uh, equally important is the increase in the limitations attributable to Section 179 expensing. Uh, specifically, the old law was 500,000 max, as we knew, and it's a phase out beginning at 2 million, and now that has been increased to a million, uh, and the phase out begins at, at 2.5 million, and most importantly, expanded the definition of qualified property. So as uh, I've highlighted here in the slide, when we think about qualified real property, um, including certain depreciable, tangible, personal property, which is used predominantly in, you know, basically furniture, lodging, or connection with furniture and lodging. So we're obviously in that kind of hotel space. There are some new rules, if you will, that deal with roof and HVAC and fire protection and security systems as we look at Section 179. So, you know, this is just an example for you as to the benefit if you think through it from a cost segregation study where we're allocating that purchase price, we're identifying building structure systems that we can, based on their class life, move down into a class life of, I'll say, 20 years or less. So cost segregation in combination with the 168K increase, again, I want to remind you that that is effective for assets which were placed in service effective September 28th of 2017. So a significant opportunity for uh, an immediate expense there. Don't forget that the tangible property regulations, those uh, final regs that were issued in September of 2013 that we've all worked through in the 14 and subsequent taxable year returns to identify units of property, that's still alive and well. So when we think about where we've had, uh, you know, I'll say a damage or we're replacing specifically a, a portion of that real property, specifically I'll say in, in a roof capacity, or if we've had a casualty loss scenario, um, remember that we're applying new rules uh, with respect to our ability uh, around that roof or that structural item and what's often referred to as the RABI rules to incur or actually classify an expense. And so uh, the capitalization of a new roof, for example, in the recon area, uh, we can elect, obviously, the partial disposition study rule dealing with units of property. We can look at it on a 179 expense basis. Um, and then, obviously, when we think about uh, 168K, uh, the election there to go ahead and expense that asset uh, along with the other uh, ADR depreciation method. So a lot going on in the cost recovery area.
Remember, there's a business interest deduction under 163J, um, and uh, that is a significant change. Ultimately, the business interest, and this could be very you know, impactful to the recon industry. Sarah's going to talk more about that. Um, is that new limitation to 30% of, of adjusted taxable income. And uh, I would point out uh, that with I have average gross receipts of $25 million or less, you would be exempt from that limitation. Um, also, just as a pointing out that for tax years beginning before January of 2022, that adjusted taxable income is computed without regard, that's without regard to any deduction allowable for depreciation, amortization, or depletion. And, also without regard, uh, at least in the 17 year dealing with, uh, with DPAD. So Sarah's going to talk more about 163J uh, later in the presentation. So as we leave the cost recovery and depreciation area of uh, focus and the Tax Cuts Jobs Act, as well as things that we need to begin to think about, bonus depreciation, assets acquired in place and service after September 27th, so those September 28th through December 31, 17 assets. Remember to consider your uh, fourth quarter investments so as to maximize and utilize that benefit. We've already addressed the increase in Section 179 and the thresholds. Um, we would point out that we do not know at this time what states will do. Many states decouple already, but some do not. And so that's one of those uh, to be determined as we look at the implications at a, a state level uh, from uh, the 179 perspective. And last, as I indicated, the uh, 263 little a rules are alive and well. There are certainly opportunities available in 17 um, with respect to our uh, eight to nine units of property when we're dealing with uh, commercial real property and non-residential property. The de minimis expensing rules are still there. And then, of course, as I referred to the RABI rules, so RABI being the restoration, the adaptation, the betterment, or the improvement. Um, so those rules are still applicable and still, from a planning perspective, available in 17 and going forward. So let's move quickly to accounting methods. There was simplification in the Tax Cuts Jobs Act. As we know, that was a big momentum piece of this bill is to try and simplify. Um, but 1,100 pages later and a lot of questions that uh, you all and we are still trying to clarify. But most importantly, from a uh, accrual to cash, um, the cash method of accounting, as we know, was limited previously to the $5 million. We've moved that up now underneath the Tax Cuts Jobs Act to the $25 million of gross receipts three, uh, threshold. Uh, when you think about long-term contracts, uh, again, the $10 million average annual gross receipts was moved up to uh, $25 million. So you begin to see um, some simplification and as well as some alignment when you think about taxpayers that can use the cash method of accounting, uh, as well as when we look at our long-term contract accounting methods. Um, my, the point that I would say from a planning perspective is remember we are in a unique environment right now uh, as we move from 17 to 18, whether uh, that happens to be at the pass-through level uh, where we don't have the 199 Cap A that Sarah will talk about, that 20% phantom deduction, um, or it's simply the compression of the rate from 39.6 down to 37, and then factoring in that 20%, likely you get to 29.8. So there's a lot of rate arbitrage, permanent tax savings that can still be applied when we think about the 2017 and the lowering of tax rates in 2018. So we want to make sure from planning uh, underneath the Tax Cuts Jobs Act that we're accelerating all those deductions attributed to our operations and our fixed assets when we think about the real estate construction industry as a whole. Um, so we want to make sure that we're looking at accounting methods um, as well as we're looking at all of our fixed assets and taking advantage of these cost recovery items. A reminder around the September 28, 2017 date. Obviously, we want to use that prior year NOL to offset as much income in 17 as possible attributable to the rate arbitrage. 
uh, to the extent we can find ourselves from planning perspective, whether that's due to the acquisition of assets post uh, September 27th or other accounting methods we identified, prepaid, recurring items exception, if we find ourselves in a net operating loss, we want to make sure that we're maximizing that carryback into 15 and 16 because effective January of 2018, uh, we no longer have that carryback treatment. We only have an indefinite carry for it. And then last, but probably uh, equally as important as we look to the year end, we want to make sure we're reviewing our passive activity for maximizing those allowed losses. So again, that's simply a focus on the rate arbitrage, ILA, permanent tax savings uh, that we could potentially see between the, the taxable years. So when you think about credit, the 165 plus provisions that were previously in the statute at the federal level now shrinking back to likely 160, this is a summary of what occurred. Uh, there was always a belief that low-income housing credit uh, would be preserved. That was one of only two federal credits that were called out on a bipartisan basis. So low-income or LHITC credits are alive and well uh, for those taxpayers that are in that industry space. So that good news, it was preserved. Um, when you think about the new markets tax credits, uh, utilizing that financing mechanism attributable to the development in what are often referred to as depressed areas in the United States. That was a $5.5 billion uh, PATH Act uh, element. It was modified. It was called to be repealed, but new markets tax credits are alive and well, and there's approximately $2.5 billion of uh, financing and credits that are still out there from a real estate development uh, perspective. Um, the rehabilitation credits, the historic credits, if you will, uh, again, were called uh, to really be eliminated. Uh, those were modified, obviously lowering the 20% to 10% with a number of transitional rules that talk about projects that were started in 17 and are going to be completed uh, prior to 2000 and uh, really 19. So if you're in that, uh, I'll say, historic area, Good news, it was, was modified, still retained, but unfortunately some reductions. Conservation easements, um, often a charitable contribution planning uh, opportunity that is also dealing uh, with land and obviously the revitalization or the conservancy of that land that the right ultimately gets contributed to uh, a charitable entity. Um, conservation easements actually become more powerful uh, from a planning perspective is the 50% limitation is ultimately increased on that charitable up to 60%. Um, when you think about the work opportunity tax credit, that credit at the federal level that is to subsidize the generation in new jobs across nine very specific areas of employment, um, worker opportunity tax credit is still alive and well. It was ultimately preserved. Um, and then when you think about unused business credits and how do we handle that, there were changes in the statute attributable to what can we do with that unused business credit as, as we go forward. So those were preserved. Energy credits are always very specific to the real estate and construction industry. Uh, those provisions uh, come in really four buckets. You have a credit, a deduction, a rebate, or exemption when you think about commercial and non-commercial uh, property and the benefit of a credit or a deduction or rebate or exemption. Unfortunately, uh, Section 179D, Cap D that is, around energy efficiency, around very large, predominantly commercial non-resident or residential, multi-residential structures uh, expired 1231-16, coupled with the multi-residential credit under 45L. What we expect to see, um, and we saw this already begin to be discussed, is that there is an extender piece of tax legislation that is likely to be tied to the January 19th budget reconciliation to continue to fund the government. And so we would expect that a number of the energy provisions uh, that sunset 1231-16 could be attached to that, that budget reconciliation bill. We'll soon see, because uh, as we know, the government is on a, on a uh, January 19th. Uh, however, what was retained uh, was solar uh, and geothermal, uh, very specific to uh, 
real estate and construction along with wind production tax credits. So the credit side had some changes. We go back to this slide just because cost segregation and our ability to take that 39 and 27 and a half year uh, asset straight line and move those assets down under a class life of 20 years for those so-called non-structural assets uh, becomes more impactful effective September 28, 17 and, and going forward as I highlighted previously uh, to round immediate expensing. And so as we're thinking about the real estate and construction industry, very impactful uh, towards cost segregation and of course when we think about any capital investment, we are looking for other opportunities, energies I've touched on, the TPR rules I've touched on and certainly in an accounting method area coupled with any industry specific incentives that could occur um, depending upon where you are, uh, whether that's a new markets tax credit or whether that's an enterprise zone. So when we think about structuring and going forward, we as a firm have developed what we call BEAM, uh, Business Entity Analysis Modeling. With any type of tax rate reduction, we're going to step back and say, well, what is the best energy structure for me? If I'm an S corporation, do I consider moving to a C corporation recognizing the, the drop in the C corp rate? Um, there's a lot of implications here. Our message to you as we are releasing our BEAM, our business entity analysis model, to help and assist you is we want to make sure we're proactive. We want to make sure we assess the impact from what is old law to new law, specifically as Sarah will talk to the 20% 199 cap A qualified business deduction. We want to look at all the acceleration of deductions and accounting methods as well as cost recovery and then obviously any automatic accounting methods we want to take advantage of in that 2017 year. So we would encourage you on the call to work with us. Um, all existing entity selection should be reviewed. This is, as we know, a 31-year in the making major piece of tax legislation, uh, you know, dating back to the old recodified Tax Reform Act of 86. Specifically, all existing related pass-through entities should be reviewed to determine if combination or separation of activities is appropriate, and Sarah will kind of talk about that in QBI. We want to make sure we're maximizing or minimizing, really, uh, the overall effective tax rate to determine whether changes should be considered. Um, and uh, again, a lot there from an entity perspective. We want to make sure we focused on the expiration of provisions and the benefit of individual, individual and pass-through entities. Obviously, the uh, inability now at state and local income tax level, uh, you know, minimization of property tax and state and local to $10,000 has significant implications. Uh, the changes in AMT and pass-throughs have significant implications. Um, so we also want to make sure that we're looking for what we call check-the-box elections. Um, those can be made. 75 days after January 1, 2018 and still be effective for 2018. So that March 15th filing or really 16th filing becomes very important if we want to revoke an S-Corp election or if we want to make some check-the-box elections. Uh, we don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all of that. So at the end of the day, from a credit and accounting methods team perspective and cost recovery and all the things we've gone through, uh, we will scope opportunities at no cost for you all or any of our prospective clients, and our services include just the summary as we've said here. So I want to make sure that I allow time for my co-presenter who's going to start with the new limitation on interest expense 163J. So Sarah? Great. Thank you, Ron. Uh, yeah, we are going to start with this because, uh, and then work into the more complicated. Uh, so hope everybody has a good big cup of coffee for this afternoon because we're going to talk about some things that uh, maybe, maybe the heartburn these will give you will keep you alert and awake too. But very first off, we have to talk about the limitation on business interest expense deduction. Generally, the interest expense deduction is going to be limited to about 30% of adjusted taxable income. An adjusted taxable income, you can think of it as, as EBITDA, uh, at least before the uh, 2022, and then starting after that, there will be no, no further uh, addbacks for depreciation and amortization. Uh, and we have an example that I'll show you where that can make a big impact. So a couple of years to think about whether or not uh, you may need to um, 
rearrange the debt financing uh, situation for a business. The determination is made at the entity level, so uh, a, a partnership or an S corporation will make the determination of how much of that interest expense is limited, but it will pass through to the partner or the shareholder the portion that was disallowed. So if that uh, partner or S corporation shareholder can use that disallowed amount against uh, some other uh, business income, there, there's some other taxable income which would allow for a further deduction, they have that opportunity. Any disallowed interest is going to carry forward and it will retain its character. So um, uh, we will continue to see this as interest expense and it will roll into next year's calculation. And as I mentioned earlier, the intent is really to sort of draw down that difference between debt equity and in, uh, interest and, and um, debt and equity in vet when it comes to investment. So let's take a quick look at an example. In this situation, we have a preliminary calculation of taxable income of $650,000. And that includes a depreciation de deduction of a million dollars and an interest expense deduction of a million dollars. But once we apply the new limitation and we uh, take 30% of adjusted taxable income, in this case, <clears throat> that involves adding back that interest expense and depreciation deduction to calculate out how much we're allowed, we are going to be limited to no more than 796,000 of interest expense deduction. That means for this potential taxpayer, uh, their taxable income goes up from 650,000 to 853, and there is an interest carryover to the next tax year of $203,600. So not a, uh, a terribly unfortunate increase, but you, you are talking about losing uh, $200,000 of deduction with this new law. Well, if we go out further, say what happens if we get out to year 2023 when the test for or the, the definition for taxable, adjusted taxable income is changed. Well, out here again, we start with our preliminary calculation of taxable income of 650,000, but now we can no longer add back the depreciation expense. So the adjusted taxable income is lower than it was in 2018, meaning I'm allowed even less in actual interest expense deduction. In this case, my this company's taxable income goes up from 650,000 to a million 153, and there's a 503,000 uh, dollar of, of interest expense carry forward. So not a great result. Uh, the, the deduction is not lost; it is carried forward into the future. Uh, if one more element to be tracked, it's going to make partnership and S partnership accounting for this item much more complicated and another role for its schedule and information from the partners that will have to be maintained and, and solicited from them. Now, a little bit of good news, as, Mar as Ron mentioned earlier, small businesses, those with annual gross receipts of less than $25 million are completely exempt. This provision, limiting interest expense, uh, no, it does not apply to them. So they are completely free to uh, deduct as much interest as they are able to. Also, when it comes to public utilities and, and cooperatives, those two are exempt. Floor plan financing for motor vehicles. So a motorized vehicle that moves people and things uh, counts in here and is, and is fully deductible. Other interest that may be paid by a dealership um, on its inventory or, or other kinds of borrowings would be, could be subject to this limitation, but floor plan financing is exempted. Finally, for real estate uh, businesses and real property trades or businesses can choose to elect out of this regime. It is a permanent election once made uh, and the downside to this is that the business must use the alternative depreciation system, or ADS. That's not necessarily a terrible downside because it means moving from, for uh, commercial real property from a 39 year straight line deduction over 39 years to 40 years. For residential real property, it would be moving from straight line over 27 and a half years to 
uh, uh, 30 years. And for the qualified improvement property, which uh, is now a 15-year depreciation method, uh, that moves to an 18 year. So a little bit of slowing down in the depreciation deduction, but in exchange there is no limitation to the amount of interest expense associated with that real property trader business. And we actually do have a definition of real property trader business uh, for this section. It ties to the definition used for uh, real estate professional activities, a real estate professional in the uh, uh, passive activity loss rules of 469. So those businesses that uh, can qualify an individual investor as a real estate professional or a real estate operator are the same businesses that can here elect to um, elect out of the business interest expense deduction. Once an election is made, it is a permanent election. It's not something that can be chosen uh, year by year. It is a one-time election to be made. Okay. Uh, if that wasn't complicated enough, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the new special pass-through business deduction uh, of Section 199A. This has everyone's attention, uh, and it, it can be complicated. We'll try to simplify it and give you a framework to work from here. So the big picture is Section 199A is a non-cash deduction that effectively reduces the top individual income tax rate from 37% to 29.6% on taxable income received from a pass-through business. A pass-through business being a partnership, S corporation, trust, or a, a uh, uh, sole proprietorship. So that 20% that deduction, well, how, what is it determined on? Well, it's 20% of combined qualified business income. Well, that's nice, but what is qualified business income? Well, that's got to be determined by each pass-through trade or business. And it's a test of either 20% uh, of that trader business's income, business income, or 50% uh, of W-2 wages, or 25% of W-2 wages plus 2.5% of cost of tangible property. But that's a lot to go through. So we will walk through an example to show you how those uh, tests pile onto each other and work together to come up with what appears to be a good answer. But first off, when we talk about qualified business, we have to make sure that we know that, that certain bit trader businesses are excluded from this benefit, and that is specified service trader, service trader business. Those are in the area of health, law, consulting, uh, financial services, brokerage businesses, as investment management, including asset management. Um, it's any time where the principal asset is the reputation or skill of one or more of its employees or owners. So, even if you're an owner who's not active in the business, if the business is all based on personal activity, so you hold an interest in a property management business, if that property management business is based on the personnel and employees doing work there, then it is a specified service trader business to you, the owner. Fantastic good news for engineering and architecture. Those services are exempt. Uh, they are not treated as specified service trader business. They are treated as uh, just a regular kind of trader business activity. All right. The other key point is that there are some uh, taxable income guidelines that tell us when does this specified service trader business rule apply and when do we have to follow that uh, W-2 wage limit cap. So these are the important numbers to keep in mind. 157500 for single taxpayers, taxable income, and 315000 for married filing jointly, and then 207000 for single taxpayers, and 415000 for married filing jointly. So if we are less than, if a, if a taxpayer's taxable income before taking a 199A deduction is below that amount, we do not have to worry about what, whether it is uh, specified service income. We do not have to worry about whether there are any W-2 wages at all. Uh, there are no limits and no exclusions here. At the other end of the scale, when we talk about the, the middle range, now we start to phase out that deduction. Uh, we start to move from fully allowing everything to, well, wait a minute, we're, we want these W-2 wage limitations and the, the phase down of the specified service income to start to apply. And then finally, once we're over these thresholds, the wage limit is fully applied and there is no 
uh, 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 allowance for those specified services. If you have a specified service above these income and your taxable income is above these amounts, you are not going to get a Section 199A deduction. So how does that work in person? Well, we, we have a series of steps we go through. We're going to ask, of course, just as we talked about, we need to know what the taxable income is. We need to know what kind of business income this is. Then we run a preliminary calculation. And then we start te running these tests, test one, test two, test three, to find out what, whether or not there is a good deduction available here. So let's, let's do an example. This makes more sense. John and Jane are 50-50 partners. They have a rental real estate business. There are no other workers. There's only some real property assets, and the partners do not take a salary. So in 2018, the rental real estate partnership generates $100,000 of income. Jane and her husband have taxable income over uh, $420,000. So the question is, can Jane deduct 20% of her share of the partnership income under 199A? So let's look at this quick example. So right off the top, we say Jane's allocable share of, of income is $50,000, and 20% of that is $10,000. So we have our preliminary number. But as I mentioned before, we have to know what her income is. Her income is over 420000 So those second set of comparison tests, the, the 50% of, of W-2 wages and the W-2 wages and tangible property test both come into play. And in this case, there are no W-2 wages for this, but we do have some tangible property. So we, she is eligible to get a piece of this into consideration. Uh, then we compare, okay, well, what's the, the or a preliminary test number, $10,000, compared against this secondary test, and we take the lesser. So she's going to get actually a $10,000 deduction out of this business. So good for her. All right, example two. Let's assume instead of a rental management, uh, a rental operation, that this is actually just a property management business. There are no other workers, there are no assets at all, and the partners do not take a salary for the effort they put in. Again, we have um, $100,000 of income from this. In this case, we're going to look at partner John, and his taxable income is $150,000. So we have now uh, the question of can John deduct 20% of his partnership income? Well, in John's case, uh, we have the his initial test shows that of the 50,000 income, he might be eligible for 10,000 deduction. We look at his taxable income; it's less than that uh, threshold of 157,000. So he it does not have to worry about the allocable share of W-2. He does not have to worry about what kind of income this is. He's going to get the $10,000 uh, uh, QBI. Then he moves right on to test three and compares that against 20% of his income for the year, and so therefore he gets a $10,000 199A deduction. Well, let's go back to Jane. How would Jane fare in this situation? Again, we have her same situation. She has $420,000 of income. Well, that means that if this is service income, she is over the threshold. She is not going to get any deduction at all. So we stop right there. She comes up with a zero. So you can see you could have two partners in a partnership or shareholders in an S corporation in the business, and they have very different results as to whether or not they get a deduction for uh, the activities that are going on. So what do we know for sure? Well, it, the business must be effectively connected with an activity going on here in the United States. It, the trader business must be within the United States. But what is a trader business? There is not a good definition attached to this new law. It was written in a hurry, and they failed to leave a good trail as to how trader business would be defined. There are a number of other definitions in the code that the IRS may link to one of those, uh, or a correction may come back through. So would a piece of property owned in a partnership under a triple net lease, would that count as a trader business? Well, probably not under Section 162, but it might under 469. So which of these is going to count? What about multiple activities <coughs> in one organization? How will those be treated? Can we divide them up into separate and allocate income out? What if I've got activity both within the United States and outside of the United States in one business? Can I get a partial deduction for the activity going on in the U.S.? What about commonly owned businesses? Will we have to group them together or consider them together? Or would we have the opportunity to do so if one has W-2 wages but another does not? 
these are all great questions we're looking for guidance for when it comes to how we're going to be able to classify trade or business for this rule. We do know for sure that investment income uh, is not considered uh, eligible for this. And also, if the owner is receiving W-2 wages from the S corporation or a guaranteed payment from his partnership or services he's providing, uh, then those W-2 wages are not considered eligible for this deduction. They would still count in the testing of the W-2 wages paid in full by the organization, but not in adding this income in in order to get a 20% deduction on what would be compensation. So everybody's looking. Uh, I think that's, that's one of those areas that um, is uh, not going to be, that is still going to get taxed at ordinary income rates, that compensation. Okay, so a couple of other key points here. Number one, this whole provision expires after 2025, so we have to take that into account in any sort of planning. How much should we adjust or change up the organization structure, what's happening, uh, when knowing that this right now, this may expire in just a few short years. The deduction is termed at the shareholder partner level, so they're going to need information from their pass-through uh, company, their pass-through investments. Those partnerships are going to have, at the same time they send out the schedules K-1, they're going to need in, to include information on W-2 wages, on the cost of tangible property allocable to that partner or shareholder, so that they can then prepare these calculations on their own return. The deduction comes. Uh, uh, late in the tax return, it comes after um, adjusted gross income on an individual's return, and it's not actually an itemized deduction. This follows after that. Uh, and the good news is we're not going to have to make AMT adjustments. Um, and there is a carryover of any negative amounts, so losses would carry forward to the next year and affect the 199A deduction in the succeeding year. All right, that's a lot to take in. Uh, I know, and uh, it's very complicated, but I want to get you started thinking about this and starting to have some conversations about your own organization or your investments uh, or the partners in your, uh, the partners and investors in your company and how they may fare under this rule. A couple of other things that are surprising that came through the law. One of them is this excess business loss limitation for non-corporate taxpayers, and that is. Uh, the, the, there's a slowdown, if you will, a tapping of the brakes on business losses. So in this brief example I have on the right-hand side, the, the Schedule E shows a, a, a cumulative loss of about 750000 from a pass-through business. Uh, the Schedule C has a little bit of income of about 15000 Well, the rules say that for a married filing joint return, you're not going to be allowed more than $500,000 of net loss from a business um, on, your, on the return in any one year. So in this case, they're going to have to tap the brakes and not be allowed to take $235,000 of that loss for this tax year. The good news is it, it becomes an NOL and can be used the very next year. So if this loss occurs in 18 and is um, uh, suspended and not allowed to be used or limited and not allowed to use on the 18 tax return, it becomes an NOL and can be used on the 2019 return. The only downside to that is the new rules for net operating losses limit the net operating loss to only offsetting 80% of income for a year. So uh, this loss really, like I say, it's, it's um, just sort of slowing down when you can take your loss and carrying that forward. Uh, under those rules. This can occur, I'm thinking of, of opportunities when this could occur in a year where a lot of passive activity losses may be freed up uh, because of another business that, uh, that was sold or another transaction or disposal of a, um, a, a passive activity which frees up a lot of loss. We just talked about the 100% um, bonus depreciation, so you can imagine that there could be some very significant bonus depreciation uh, deductions claimed and losses flowing through, and this just is going to slow down a little bit on that timing of the deduction. A couple other partnership provisions that are important to the real estate industry. 
carried interest. There's been so much discussion on uh, how would carried interest be uh, treated, taxed, moved to ordinary income or otherwise. Uh, this law sort of resolved it. It said, look, you can have long-term capital gain treatment for carried interest. That is, those, those interests that are awarded for, as compensation for services provided. You can have long-term capital gain treatment, but you have to hold that for three years before that treatment is allowed. Uh, otherwise, it's going to come through as short-term capital gain. The nice thing is they didn't say it was going to come through as compensation or uh, uh, a self-employment type, type income. They said it was going to come, flow through as short-term capital gain. Another good provision for partnerships, the repeal of technical terminations. That is advantageous because now we won't have uh, those accidental trips over 50% ownership change in the middle of a year, which inadvertently closes, closes off the tax year. Uh, and we're scrambling to get a uh, tax return filed in short order. Uh, a couple of other items that do affect basis this, as they're distributed out. So where are we with this law? There are uh, still needed guidance in many areas. We are looking for definitions. As we talked about we don't know what trader business is. Uh, we don't know a number of things, uh, how they'll be traded and how they'll be reported out. We need examples. Uh, we need examples on how the uh, Section 199A calculates. Let us help us to confirm the ordering of the loss disallowance rules, the interest expense uh, 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 disallowance rule, and also then the 199A deduction. All of those report out and talk about taxable income. We think we know the order, but it would sure be helpful to have the IRS confirm for us through some frequently asked questions or some other items what that ordering is so that we can be certain of how to, to calculate those items. Uh, the 199A lost carry forward amounts, uh, how do we, are there any guidance or rules that they want around the W-2 wage compensation question? Um, lots of things going on, e even with respect to the depreciation rules that Ron discussed earlier, there is a glitch in the final bill which says everybody believes that the qualified improvement property is 15-year uh, depreciable life, but that actually did not make it into the actual law. So there is going to be, need to be a technical correction on that. The conference and the legislators have all said, the congressmen have all said, yes, that's what we intend, that's what we mean, that's what we, we're going to have happen but we still need to get that fixed inside the law itself. So uh, finally, permanence. We don't know if these are going to be rolled back. The right now, they are set to expire, many of these provisions, the individual provisions, these pa special pass-through provisions. We do know the corporate tax rate is set. Uh, it is not planned to expire, but uh, we don't know whether a what the next thought will be by the next generation of uh, uh, lawmakers and where they will fit within this and what the budget needs may be. So lots of things that are we don't know, but we're going to plan and we're going to make the best decisions possible within this and provide the best benefit as we can and take advantage of these rules while they are with us. Uh, so lots of work still needs to be done on the law itself. Lots of work needs to be done to talk about these issues and these opportunities. And uh, Ron, I see you've been answering a couple of questions. You want to talk, talk about some of those for us? Yeah. Uh, I haven't been. I'm not current on them. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I was I was getting ahead of myself here. Uh, okay. So as we're, we have some time for some questions. I see some have come into the pod. Ron is taking a look at those uh, now. We did have a question about um, uh, real estate management being a specified trader, trader business. Uh, you know, the, the term used is investment management, asset management, financial advisor. Um, and so the general feeling is if it is pretty much personal service and a professional service, then it's going to fall into that specified service trader business. Uh, again, we don't have 100% clarity on that definition, 
but that seems to be where the effort and focus is going. Um, so why would a company consider uh, outside of double taxation? Uh, one of the things that we're ta thinking about with C corporation versus pastor, that 21% tax rate um, with long-term effect. Uh, I think it was Warren Buffett who was quoted as saying, hey, you know, I, I got a 20% raise on all my companies because I went from owning 65% uh, of their net earnings after tax to 79% of the earnings after tax. So for an investor like himself who is looking at retaining those companies, reinvesting in those companies, uh, not looking to cash out anytime soon or is only going to cash out from a sale of the investment itself, uh, then that C corporation can make some sense over a pass-through. But in a situation where income is still going to be distributed, is still going to need to be pulled out for um, family needs, for compensation needs, for use in other situations, uh, and not retained and put back to work within the cor corporation, you know, pass-through is still a very useful, useful methodology, and the overall tax rate would be lower in those those circumstances. So it really depends on uh, a number of factors, more than just the tax rate to make a decision in that regard. So I think with that, Ron, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I would follow up on Sarah's comment in regards to the discussion on our, our business entity analysis model. Was, um, it, what I, I would comment is there are so many variables that are non-tax that would be a consideration from a business perspective. And, and Sarah highlighted a couple of those with respect to, you know, let's assume an entity is an S corporation is considering revoking their S corp election going to a, to a C corp because they want to lock in that, that permanent 21%. Remember then we now have a five-year holding period. And remember that, you know, the, the business decision has to be, well, what are we going to do in regards to our dividends on a going forward basis or our distributions, um, as well as what does that mean when we ultimately potentially dispose of the entity, or have we any consideration of disposing of the entity uh, in the next five years? So what we've identified is probably 22 to 30 what I would call business variables that need to be considered in the context of our business entity analysis model. You know, certainly calculating the rate reduction uh, fairly straightforward, even though there's a lot of complexity, and as Sarah correctly said, a lot of uh, clarification that still needs to occur. Um, based on our general belief and discussions with the National Office of IRS is that, um, you know, that guidance is, is probably not going to be coming quickly uh, out of the service, so we would expect that we won't see some guidance until hopefully late July, uh, maybe even into August at the earliest um, from the standpoint of, you know, all the questions that we have, whether it's 163J or 199-CAP-A, um, separation, aggregation. Um, but do remember that um, as the explanation goes, the tax tail um, can wag the dog, but there's a number of business considerations that need to, uh, to be taken into account in regards to the uh, what entity should I be? Um, you know, we do know the permanency, as Sarah correctly said. Uh, we don't know, uh, given a number of the individual sides, you know, sunset. Um, and in a number of these temporary provisions in the cost recovery, what does that look like um, as we go forward? So just a lot of variables to consider. Um, you know, stay tuned as we will continue to do external webinars and frequently asked questions and put out e-blasts for, for our clients that are very industry specific to recon. That's right. Thank you, Ron. And uh, just as a reminder, we do have some more uh, targeted webinars coming up. And for those that have uh, international activities, I mean, we have not even touched on that in this presentation at all. Extremely important to pay attention to the dramatic changes that have happened in international tax. So we invite you to participate in our uh, succeeding webinars as they come up in the next several weeks and join us again for another Tuesday uh, or an occasional Thursday for a webinar on items in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. Uh, 
Uh, Mark, uh, without any last comments, I think we will sign off and say thank you very much. And if you have questions uh, you'd like to forward on to us, we'd certainly appreciate it. All right, this is Mark. Thank you, Sarah and Ron. I think we did um, have uh, one last question from uh, someone that asked, in short, if you make more than $415,000, there's no pass-through credit. Um, I believe you're talking about the 20% deduction, and that is not uh, not true. You would still qualify if it's a qualified business, no matter what your income level. It's just if you're less than 415,000, then you're still.